Welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Ben Hunter, Booktopia's fiction category manager. This is a podcast about books and the people who read them and write them. And this one's a real special one. I mean, all of our podcasts are special, but I like to think of this one as extra special. Um, and that's all about the guest I've got with me today. Emily Maguire is the author of six novels, including the Stella Prize and Miles Franklin Award shortlisted An Isolated Incident. She has also written three books of nonfiction, and her essays on sex, feminism, culture, and literature have been published widely. Emily was the 2018-19 writer in residence at the Charles Perkins Center at the University of Sydney, and her new novel is called Love Objects. Emily McGuire, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here. It's an honor. Um, and it's been a long time between novels for you, so uh we're recording this just a few days before Love Objects is published. How are you feeling? How are you going? Um, feeling pretty good about it. You're right. It is a it is a long time between novels. I think an isolated incident was 2016, so that's a, a good five year gap there. Um, I have written a non fiction book in between, which took a lot of my time. Um, but yeah, it it feels great actually to have another novel out in the world. It's a really different experience um, to talk about a novel than it is to talk about a nonfiction book. I think. Yeah, but this is a novel with a lot of content. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I should also say yes. That's also why there was a quite a big gap that this book has a lot of um, real world research behind it. Yeah, um, uh, Love Objects is a. It's a challenging and confronting and wonderful book that has made me feel a lot of things. I finished reading it last night and it's still ticking over. Um, I've been thinking about it and how I would explain it or even try to explain it. And I, I've, I've been thinking I would boil it down to being uh, a study of how trauma can isolate people. Um, and particularly when people are already vulnerable, how terrible that can be. <laughs> um, how would you describe this new novel? Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that's definitely in there. Um, for me, the the relationship at the heart of this novel is between an auntie and her niece and, and nephew to a slightly lesser extent. And one of the things for me, thinking all the way through it, um, certainly that trauma and that isolation is there, but I also was thinking a lot about the question of um, kind of what what we owe each other as people. Um, I think, you know, there's a sense if someone's in your immediate family, then whether whether this ends up happening or not, there's a sense that you're sort of responsible for each other, a parent with a child and, and vice versa. But when even get uh, certainly the, the kind of culture I grew up in, even one degree removed from that, um, there's sort of a sense of why would a niece, in this case the character Lena, um, really kind of put her life on hold to clean up after her auntie's mess. And that's something that was sort of foremost in my mind in, in this was writing a book about um, people who, you know, um, take responsibility for each other in a way. Right. Uh, for good and bad, because in this case, and, you know, I'm sure we'll get into the story of it a little bit more, but, but there's a case in which uh, Lena is helping Ooh. someone who doesn't want help. Yeah, and and that sense of you know how do you how do you help someone who doesn't want help or doesn't need help? Should you do that at all? And and who gets to decide? And and all that was sort of um, really driving the the emotional um, story of the book. Anyway, can we? I mean, yeah, it's hard. I, I don't know how much we want to reveal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's always a thing. So. Uh, but should we start with Nick because mm. um, I think that's the perspective the book begins with, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh tell us about her and her just she she has uh a colorful life <laughs> yeah nick, nick is a um i think a really tough smart middle-aged woman she's a lifelong and very proud checkout chick um really actually loves her job and wouldn't want to do anything else um she lives alone in a house that she inherited from her mum um she's you know this really um, happy person generally and, and independent and all those things. But um, she also has a lot of stuff, yep. like like walk through the front door and have to not open it fully and turn on your side with your arms up in your air to walk through kind of level of stuff in her house. And um, this is something that is her 
her private world. It's a and it's a place that makes her very happy to be in there, all amongst her stuff. It's sort of where she feels most safe and and calm and loved. Um, and I guess the the thing that you know sets the story going is that um, she she has a fall. Yeah. Because there's so much stuff, it uh, a lot of it collapses on her, and then she becomes a problem for to be fixed. <laughs> Right, and in an instant she goes from being this perfectly independent person who mm. was a, a rock for her niece mm. um, to being this is the precise opposite, to being mm. completely isolated and vulnerable and um, alone. And I'm fascinated with this hoarding because um, it's a private world as you say Mm. um her niece doesn't know about it her niece is her best friend Mm. um, i think you say in the novel and uh, but she's she's also uh an active member of her community she's not Mm. entirely alone as Mm. you might imagine the stereotype of a hoarder Mm. to be um but this accumulation of stuff happens in in private is in your research because you you did um this uh residency and this was what the research was about and you were saying before the podcast that uh, you went and interviewed real life hoarders mm. um is this a is this a common thing that it's a surprise yeah um it can be going into this um because i had wanted to write about this kind of character for a long time and i was sort of waiting um for the opportunity to make sure that i could get it really right which the um, charles perkins fellowship um, gave me that opportunity to spend a year researching and um, I mean I guess the first thing to say about people who hoard is that there's all kinds of variations <laughs> in that behaviour. There's, yep. there's not well, you know, one pattern that is followed. But I think um, one of the things that was most important to me was to write a character who didn't conform to the stereotypes that most people who only uh, think they understand hoarding because maybe they see the odd news article when someone, you know, uh, has a really squalor situation where the authorities intervene. Yeah. Um, around the time when I started researching the book, there was a, a horrific news story where a, a dead body was found in a hoarder's house in Sydney. So you get these kind of headlines. And then there's shows like Hoarders, which are sort of, um, yeah, uh, show a very, <laughs> uh, you know, it's got to fit in a half an hour format or whatever, or a 45-minute format of fixing this uh, really intense problem. So... There's sort of a lot of stereotypes associated with hoarding behaviour and what I wanted to do was show some of the variation on that while still being true um, to the lived experience of the people I spoke to. And it actually is fairly common um, for people who live alone to have hoarding as their secret, although that's often not how those people would describe it themselves. It is private, mm. but it's not necessarily a secret. Um, it, it's... It's it's their home. It's 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 tied up with all kinds of other things about um, having a safe place and a place that is just theirs. And I guess the the other thing that interests me, and I, I, I want to know, and I don't know if there's an answer to this, is um, where where does um, hoarding begin, and like where, where not, not as in where, what is the origin of hoarding, but when when does it become an uh, an issue with a label mm. and when is it just a intense personality or someone with a lot of stuff? Yeah, um, it's such a good question and there isn't a clear-cut answer. I mean, it's something when people uh, found out what I was working on, so many people would say, oh, so you're writing about me then, ha, 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 um, yeah. because they and might be a bit of a pack rat to, or have a bit of clutter. Yeah, and is that offensive to someone who, for whom it is a, a real problem that they acknowledge and they want to I don't think – I, I mean, I, I can't speak – for what someone else yeah, would find sure. offensive, I don't know. But I don't think so necessarily. I mean, the thing is a lot of people who other people consider hoarders don't label themselves that way anyway. So the label is very contentious. Yeah. It's not It's not something that many people self-identify with. Um, in terms of a, a medical or a, a psychological um, diagnosis, there are specific criteria um, and a lot of them – really are focused on how is this interfering with this person's well-being or their health or their safety. So it's it's quite a, a practical um, kind of checklist of in terms – I mean, if you have a living room that cannot be used for living, if you have a bedroom that can't be slept in, right. you have a kitchen that you can't cook in, 
Um, if you have, you know, often you'll, you'll, you will have real health and safety risks um, in those homes. And, you know, it's one of the things that I find really interesting in talking about this, that, that it is something that um, healthcare professionals will diagnose or, and, or social workers will, will talk about. But someone's circumstances outside of the hoarding behaviour really affect how that diagnosis might come or if at all. Like if you have an absolutely massive house, it takes a lot longer to get it to a stage where spaces in that are unlivable, if at all. Yes. Yeah, this this is a big thing I, I, I think about around this issue. And you, you mentioned the, the show. Mm. <laughs> um, and I, I kind of I cringe at it a little bit because I, I, I kind of see it as um, – just uh, poverty porn in a mm. in a kind of a way, mm. and I think our attitude towards this is is very classist. Um, and when we think about hoarding, we often think about people living in in low quality housing or, or public housing. Um, and and then when I think, then I stretch my imagination a bit. I imagine like our CEO could be a bit of a hoarder. He mm. has a lot of books. He also collects. Um, gemstones like geodes mm. he has like dozens of the things mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> i couldn't fit that stuff in my house <laughs> no that's right it's the, the size of your house or if you have a garage or a shed or whatever yeah. all those things can make a difference and and there's definitely a classist aspect i mean that if you are wealthy enough then anything you do is seen as a, you know charming eccentricity yes. um and and you're probably safe <laughs> like there might be someone coming in and dusting all your stuff all the time and cleaning up so the health uh, risks aren't the same. There's all these other things that, that come into it um, that that are really interesting. And, and you know, the collector thing, it, even with things that are really clear cut that this person just collects this one thing so they're not a general hoarder, mm. there's still a big difference in how someone's treated if they're collecting, you know, like antique vases compared to if they're collecting garden gnomes or yes. action figurines or something. Like, it, this whole question of how we judge people on their stuff and what stuff it's okay to fill your house with and spend a lot of money on um, is, is just endlessly fascinating. Um, so Nick, this character who injures herself, uh, that's one of the terrible things that sets the wheel in motion mm-hmm. for this novel. Um, there's another one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, can we talk about it? I think we can talk around it a bit, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it. It has to do with an experience that the niece character, Lena, has on campus, which thrusts the novel into the the centre almost of the conversation that's happening right now around um, consent and rape culture mm-hmm. um, uh, in a very real way. And it's, um, it's frustrating and distressing to read um, because it's so clear and real um like i the 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 dumb question i would ask would be why did you choose to write about that Mm. but then like how how could you how could you write a book about women living in contemporary australia Mm -hmm. without talking about rape culture i don't don't know what what do you think that's such a that's such a a true and depressing um observation you know uh, with it coming out now and starting to talk about the book and people are saying oh it's so prescient you know everything that's in the news now um but it was prescient when i was writing it Mm. like it was of the moment when i was writing it like when hasn't it been of the moment you know i think of um books like charlotte wood's natural way of things and i remember her talking about writing that I think that was a 2015 book and about how the news was just overwhelming with different stories of of women being sexually exploited or assaulted in one way or the other um so yeah it is it it, in part it is because it's just there um but I guess the the more specific thing in this book and in this story um one thing is sort of what I was saying before about why would this young woman kind of drop her whole life to clean up her aunt's mess um I knew that there would have to be a pretty big problem she was dealing with for her to want to step away from her life right. at university. Um, and thinking about what that might be, unfortunately it did occur to me that it would be something of this nature, this kind of betrayal. Um, but as I wrote it more, I realised, um, you know, that sometimes when you're writing you just get these moments of serendipity and um, figuring out that what what Lena is dealing with again it's a, it's a little bit hard to talk around but a, a lot of it is to do with her privacy being breached in a in a really serious way 
um, which yes. I think is really easy to understand for most readers. It will be easy to understand why that is such a feeling of violation and so terrible, the way that her privacy is breached. Um, but Lena, with all her goodwill and determination to help her aunt, um, doesn't see that cleaning out someone's home, getting rid of a lot of their stuff um, without their consent is also a massive privacy breach. Yeah. Um, and, and again, this massive line on, on what is private, do the pe- even the people who are closest to us have a particular right uh, to interfere, all these kind of questions that I, I found them just sort of naturally um, shadowing or doubling each other as I, as I wrote out those stories. Yeah, that's, it, it comes to a real interesting nexus, doesn't it? Ah, it's, it's playing out in my brain now, <laughs> like thinking about it. Um, and the, there's, there's, uh, there's just these levels of um, personal trauma that just mm. pop up with, mm. with both Lena and her aunt Nick. And then later her brother comes into the picture with his own <laughs> issues. Um, and there's this overwhelming sense of anger and despair um, in the character of Lena, uh, which which is a, a shock change from the person you meet at the outset mm. of the novel. Mm. Um, gosh, like, uh, how does it get better? Like, because <laughs> <laughs> the book's not as grim as it sounds. <laughs> yeah, there's also so much humor in this book. There's a lot of humor, I hope, and and there's a lot of love. Like to me, that's what I kept coming back to it. That this is not mm. a dysfunctional family in the sense that they're all you know hate each other and are at each other's throats. That they, they have you know some pretty extreme conflict that happens, but um, they they really care about each other. These people, and it's just that they're all at this point in their life where they just are not. They're not connecting and part of that is not talking about what's wrong. But, you know, I think it's really interesting what you said about Lena. You know, we see in the book this really dramatic change in her because her trauma is fresh in this book. Um, Whereas Will, her brother, his is, you know, historical. It's sort of five or six years past and he is still dealing with that and that, you know, there's some stuff that comes up there a lot around shame as well. Um, But it's sort of... You know, it's differing paths too because one of the things with Nick, and this is quite common to a lot of people in in her kind of circumstance, is that there's a lot of stuff she hasn't dealt with. Um, It was too hard or she didn't have the means or she didn't have the resources, stuff in her past. And um, one of, you know, a a really effective way to self-comfort is actually in her case to surround herself with all this stuff. So, so her trauma is, is undealt with in a lot of ways. Um, Lena's is very fresh, so we're seeing her try to deal with that. Um, and Will has sort of taken the opposite tact for his and, and kind of taken off and he pretty much owns nothing um, and has nothing. And, and these different ways of dealing with trauma and with difficult things and none of those ways are, you know, going to counselling, getting a therapist. The, these kind of things just are not in the vocabulary of, of this family, this sort of uh, lower middle class, working class family. It's, it's just not in that vocabulary. It's not, it's not what you do. Um, yep. And, and so that's it. But, but the trauma's still there. The hurt's still there. It, it manifests in all these different ways. Yeah, the, um, the economic undertone of the novel is, is, is really clear. It just keeps coming back. Um, and it plays out in real time with Lena and, and what she goes through um, because she's, she's further victimised and isolated as... An outsider, mm. um, you know, it's 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 on campus at mm. University of Sydney, in, you know, this prestigious mm. prestigious sandstone university, and she is without the means to be there. Mm. She is on, you know, scholarship bursary stuff. I should say that the university is not named. Oh, book. really? <laughs> I, so I, that <laughs> was my it's imagination. But it's clearly come through uh, certain aspects are very um, recognisable to you in your experience. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> my bad. Um, yeah, but but she she's not welcome. But yeah, she and she's a you know she has a, a fellowship which is helping her to actually mm. live on campus because her family's not nearby and and all of those things just do make someone more vulnerable. It, it is a, a domino thing when one thing goes wrong if you if you're being held up. Um, in ways that give other people control over you because they're paying. Um, yeah, it's, it's just harder. Everything is that much harder and which makes it easier to walk away rather than deal with stuff. 
Yes, and it, it and it drives it home that to deal with something like rape culture, mm. you have to address <laughs> economics as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a frightening thing. Um, the other the other thing that's really present throughout the book is climate. Mm-hmm. There's um, uh, there's also the, the there's uh, it's there as a backgrounder in the form of the smoke haze mm. over Sydney. Um, but also I think it has real um, direct effect, doesn't it, particularly with Will? Yeah, yeah. So it, it was definitely something, I mean, I, I am not alone in this kind of conclusion I've come to that you, you kind of can't write contemporary fiction without it having some element of the climate catastrophe or climate crisis or whatever you want to call it in the background, especially with younger characters. I mean, I wish it was true that everybody was paying as much attention, but I think especially if you're in your 20s or younger, um, the the sense of um, inevitability and urgency at the same time about mm. the climate is it is just a part of life. And so on the one hand, while certainly with Lena's story, there's rape culture and also uh, how do we deal with the internet with stuff being out there and you can't you can't bring it back in. Um, that is just part of young people's lives, all of our lives, but especially young younger people's lives. But but so too is the climate crisis and and the sense that you know I think Will is so distressed by um, how everyone just accepts it. You know, and and this was sort of when I was writing it too. We did have all these days in Sydney where it was shoved in our face. Um, this crisis with the smoke and the ash coming down on our cars and of course that was like what people in in rural areas and other parts of the world are dealing with constantly and we just sort of had this reminder that that um, made us all pay attention for two weeks or whatever it was um and then to to fade away again and it just again feels like something like if we if we don't deal with it if we don't pay attention and talk about it like it's not it's not going to stop being a problem just because no one wants to talk about it Yes, um, and it's it's refreshing in a horrible way to see it acknowledged. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it is part of the world. Like yeah. if you if you talk in a writing class now about writing setting and writing scene, it's <laughs> it's, it's literally the air we're breathing. Yeah, um, I'm going to ask the um, big, hard, silly question: um, <laughs> Who is this novel for, and what do you want to achieve with it? Oh. My God. <laughs> that is a hard, hard question. Um, who is it for? There's so there's like several different ways I could answer that question. But um, one thing that I, I think maybe I would I would like this particular group of people to to pick it up is is people who feel in some way shamed or uncomfortable about their relationship with stuff, whether they are. Uh, have hoarding behaviour or it might be at the other extreme <laughs> um, or, or anywhere in between. I think, you know, the, the conversations I've had in researching this and, and just starting to talk about it as a published book now around this is there is so much emotion tied up in, in our relationship to stuff and and a lot of shame and you don't have to be a, a hoarder or, or have any other label on you. You know, people always say, oh, I feel so silly about how much I care about these shoes or I feel really embarrassed about how much I, you know, uh, feel attached to this or that object. And and I, I think I, I would like people to feel, um, to, to read this book and, you know, not feel seen in a way that's like giving them approval for whatever their particular behaviour is because a lot of our behaviour, I mean, this ties into the climate catastrophe too, a lot of our behaviour as humans to stuff and what we think we need and how we treat it in landfill and all of that is is very destructive. But But just to see how human it is, that it yep. might manifest differently, but it, it's actually a very human thing to to invest in motion, emotion in stuff and there shouldn't be this shame attached to that in the way that there is. Yes, there's a serious amount of othering we do. Yeah, and, and I guess as with a lot of other things, uh, self-justification, like people yeah. will talk about, well, yes, I spent, you know, thousands of dollars on this handbag, but at least I'm not um, getting fast fashion, you know, and getting lots of $5 things and... And then people at the other end will be like, well, I'm, at least I'm not one of these people who spends all their money on an expensive handbag. And I, <laughs> you know, it's, it's people want what they want or what, or, or what they need and get what they afford often and, and then we'll find ways to justify it and maybe have this kind of secret shame as well. And 
Um, I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer here, it, but it is something that strikes me as really human. It's not a, it's not a um, shallow thing to think about our relationship with objects. This is a book that's really um, interesting. It's a book that's really um, moving um, at the same time as being confronting. Um, and, yeah, as, as I've sort of gone through these different elements, it's, um, I think it will be clear to the listener um, that it's incredibly contemporary. Mm. Um, so I, I, I want to ask, um, uh, how do you think, fiction should interact with what's going on in the headlines and um, to, a, to a prospective author who wants to write that kind of stuff, uh, what, what advice do you give for them to do it tactfully and effectively? Um, I'm the worst person to ask this question as any of my writing students will say because I'm very strong on the fact there's no right way to do it. There's no shoulds. <laughs> there's no um, have to. I think, you know, certainly for me, as I said, it's very important if I'm writing realist fiction, which I am, and contemporary, that I'm taking in the fullness of that world as my characters experience it. And I think that's something with, with all forms of fiction that, that you want to be actually representing um, what what life is actually like for your characters. Mm. And, you know, of course the, there have to be limits in that, but I, I find it quite odd when I read contemporary novels that barely acknowledge social media or the internet or <laughs> even texting. Like it's it's a little better than it, than it was even a few years ago. But there's almost this sense, you know, like uh, this time last year or, or over the last year, there's been a lot of talk about should should COVID appear in our novels? Yeah, and sure. I kind of think, well, if you're writing something in which that is part of that character's experience in that moment, then of course it should appear in the novel. <laughs> like it's it's all of these things and we, we don't know what is going to stand the test of time. And, that you know, on the question of technology in particular, I know people worry, well, this technology is going to be, you know, defunct. If, if my novel, you know, is going to be a great classic work that people are reading in 50 or 100 years, which is um, is a big call to be thinking that way anyway, I guess. But, it, it, okay, dream big, and if it is, but so what? Like, we still read Edith Wharton and the yep. way people are communicating with little calling cards through the thing. You know, we can read Jane Austen or Charles Dickens and figure out, oh, that's what you had to do to get a message to someone. Um, it doesn't actually date the book in the way people worry about of putting these contemporary issues in there, I think. Yeah, it just has to make sense. <laughs> it's it's just needs to be part of actually the characters' lived lives, yeah. like not not shoved in there to to make a point or anything. But it's if if you're writing um, how people are living, then then all these things have to be part of that. One thing that uh, shines through, I I think through through all the painful and confronting stuff that. Um, is in this book, in amongst all the joy and the humour and the... the it's, <laughs> have to emphasize yes, it's not all great. Sorry. <laughs> um, but it's compassion, right? Um, I think there's just so much compassion to be felt um, in your writing. Um, so uh, last silly question, uh, is there um, a deficit of compassion in the world today? And if so, how do we get some more? Yeah, I think there is. Um, I think... I think it's something that I do worry about is um, how little empathy a, a lot of people seem to have for people who um, live even the tiniest, tiniest little bit different lives than they do. Um, people are very judgmental and um, it, it stuns me how quick people are to judge each other and to... You know, and, and I, I think it is partly a, a social media thing, but that can't take the blame for everything. That that becomes the expression of it. But the, you know, I do feel a sense that a lot of people feel they need to have a, a real quick hot take on everything that everyone's doing, and sum up why they're doing it and and what side they're on. And there are very very few situations in life that that are that simple, that are that clear cut. There are a few. Um, I think you know what. What's done to Lena in this book would be one where it's pretty clear cut, um, but there's, there's a lot of situations that aren't, and um, I, I think that's one of the things that fiction can be so great at, and why I certainly, you know, still read fiction and love it and can't get enough of it. Is it? It does a, you know, at its best allow you to spend time feeling what it's like to be someone else 
And even if you get frustrated at their decisions or, you know, confronted or upset or whatever, it, it is, you know, in real life, we don't ever get to be in someone else's head. People can tell us what they're thinking and we can believe them or not, but we only ever get to be in our own head. Um, and in fiction, you at least get the feeling, even if it isn't real, of what it is like to be someone else, to think their thoughts and feel their feelings. And, you know, that that is an incredibly valuable thing for me. And, and you know, I, I, it's definitely something I aim for in my own writing all the time. Well, thank you for sharing that value with us. And thank you for spending some time with me today. This has been wonderful. Total pleasure. Thank you. Ellie McGuire is the author of many books, as I alluded to before. The latest is called Love Objects. It is published by Alan and Unwin. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces, and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast, and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, Australia's local bookstore, at booktopia.com.au.